Hello, and thank you so much for joining this webinar on the intersection of domestic violence and brain injury. My name is Dorothy Kozlowski. I am a Vincent DePaul Professor of Neuroscience at DePaul University in Chicago, and I'm also the co-founder and director of the Illinois Coalition to Address Intimate Partner Violence-Induced Brain Injury. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonia Crabtree-Nelson, also a professor at DePaul University um, in the social work program, and I'm also a co-founder of the Illinois Coalition. Thank you so much for joining us. We have no disclosures. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about brain injury, um, sort of its neuropathology, how it happens, and what type of brain injury occurs in the context of intimate partner violence. So when we talk about brain injury in this um, webinar, we're gonna be talking about two types of brain injury. The first you can see here is traumatic brain injury. And this is happening when a person is hit in the head or the head hits another object. And what you see is when the person's head hits an object, there is kind of a sloshing around of the brain, which is basically fat. And when that happens, the brain hits the sides of the cranium, okay, as you can see here, and it causes physical damage to the brain. Now, brain injury can also happen in the context of intimate partner violence through strangulation. What you see here is a picture of the blood vessels in the neck, along with a picture of the blood vessels that go and um, go throughout the brain. The brain is a highly vascularized organ. It requires a lot of oxygen and glucose to work, uses a lot of energy. And when someone is strangled or choked, what happens is that this um, um, the flow of blood coming up from the heart into the brain is blocked. And that can result in a type of brain injury called hypoxia ischemia. So in order to understand the consequences of brain injury um, on anyone, but specifically on someone who is a survivor of domestic violence, we need to learn a little bit about how the brain normally functions. The brain consists of these cells called neurons and they communicate via both electrical and chemical signals. So typically what happens is you have this electrical signal that arrives at one cell, one neuron. It is then sent down this long process called an axon, sort of like a long electrical cable. And when it gets to the other cell, the one that is trying to communicate with, it does so by releasing a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And you may have heard of neurotransmitters as it relates to addiction like dopamine or depression like serotonin, for example. These are all neural chemicals that are used in communicating. And this neurochemical then transmits the signal to this next neuron and so on and so on for millions and trillions of these connections. So the way the brain then is organized is that this is a picture here of your brain cut in half. So what you see here are these purple lines and these lines represent circuits. So what you see here are circuits using a particular neurochemical, in this case, it's dopamine. And each of these pathways correspond to um, the circuit that's involved with a particular behavior. So for example, this particular circuit that goes from here to here, so from the substantia nigra to the striatum, for example, that is a really important circuit for movement, okay? So a, what happens then is your normal brain is really wired for behavior in these circuits. Now, when a brain is injured, um, the cells in the brain themselves are injured, and this is through either strangulation or being hit in the head. And during injury, what happens is that there's sort of a chemical imbalance in these neurons. And in this case, you've got a, a picture here showing potassium um, rushing out of the cell. And unfortunately, it's replaced by calcium. Now, calcium is wonderful and great for our bones, right? But 
calcium in the context of a neuron is actually, it can be toxic. Um, it can also result in a massive release of neurotransmitters. That's what causes neurotransmitters to release. So all of a sudden this neuron is just releasing all of these neurotransmitters and the receiving neuron is overwhelmed. It doesn't know what to do. And so that is going to interfere with these uh, cell communications. And when these processes are happening, the neuron is very vulnerable in this condition. And any further injury or further stress can cause cell death or even more serious damage. Um, a brain can recover. Uh, we don't, there's no magic number. We don't know how long this takes, but it can, uh, the brain can kind of come back to its normal functioning. Now, the other thing that can happen, and this is primarily happening when uh, you have traumatic brain injury, is that those long cables, those axons, um, when your brain is, is being moved around in the head, these long axons, I like to think of them as like licorice or spaghetti, you can take and pull them, right? But there's a point in time where you pull too far and they snap. So that's what can happen here um, following a traumatic brain, brain injury. You can get what's called a shearing of an axon where the axon can get pulled apart and in some cases be um, broken apart altogether. So now you've lost that ability for one neuron to talk to the other. Um, it's, it's like basically having an accident in the road when you're trying to get from point A to point B. The information can't get past you can't get to your destination. So what re this results in then is that these all of these neural circuits that were formed um, now can be blocked. And what can be a little confusing with traumatic brain injury is that every time a traumatic brain injury happens, it's not like the same circuits are damaged each time. So it really depends on which circuit is damaged for what the resulting types of symptoms can be. So in a nutshell, we like to think of our nervous system when it's healthy as being wired for thought, right? Our brain has these circuits, they're formed and, and uh, to do certain things and help us to do certain behaviors. But when a brain is injured, either through a traumatic brain injury or through strangulation, these circuits become broken. And it really depends on where the circuits are broken um, uh, in terms of what types of symptoms can occur. <clears throat> what you see here is a very long list of symptoms, um, but these are many of the different types of symptoms that can occur after someone experiences a brain injury. Some of these symptoms are physical, like a headache, nausea, balance problems, dizziness, sensitivity to light or sound. Others can be an effect on sleep, sleeping either more or sleeping less. Um, you can have trouble with thinking and remembering, not remembering what happened prior to the violent episode or immediately after. Um, difficulty concentrating afterwards, difficulty getting your thoughts together, feeling mentally confused. And then lastly, mood disruption. And this can be either feeling more emotional or less emotional, feeling more irritable or sad or depressed. Now, going through this very long <laughs> set of symptoms, you might think, well, we've all probably experienced a brain injury, right? Because we've all experienced these different kinds of symptoms, perhaps at different times. And a lot of these symptoms, which we'll talk about later, are ones that can happen due to the trauma of the experiences um, uh, someone may have during um, uh, as being a survivor of intimate partner violence. So how do we know what symptom is coming from the brain injury? And the way we like to talk about this is that after a violent episode where you were strangled or someone was hit in the head, um, we like to say that if any of these symptoms are new or any of these symptoms got worse, it's very possible that they are symptoms of the brain injury itself. Now, 
all of these symptoms can be addressed. Unfortunately, there's not a magic bullet for brain injury. Um, you can't give someone a pill or a treatment that helps these cells go back to normal or, or prevents them from breaking further. Um, but there are definitely approaches to all of these symptoms that can occur following a brain injury. For example, there are medications for pain, for depression, for anxiety, for sleep. Um, there are also therapies, so physical, occupational, speech, cognitive, and psychological. Um, the, the difficulty is in that um, each person with a brain injury has to have a very individualized set of treatments because each of their symptoms uh, can be quite different. Now, in recent years, um, uh, we've heard a lot about the idea of a repeat concussion, especially in the context of sports. So we know that having one concussion or one hit to the head, it's very possible to recover and, and come back to a fairly asymptomatic type of, of life. However, individuals with repeat concussions, and what this means is that they've had multiple hits to the head over a period of time, suffer some other types of consequences. Um, and the problem is, is that with repeat concussions, you're not allowing your brain to heal. You are injuring your brain during that time of vulnerability. So you're not letting your brain heal before another injury might occur. So you're injuring these already vulnerable neurons. And there's a lot of data now to demonstrate that repeat hits to the head can lead, uh, lead to longer term deficits, longer periods of any and all of the symptoms that we discussed. There's also a good amount of evidence now that individuals who suffer from repeat concussions and also repeat hits to the head, which we'll talk about potentially later, um, it's not, you don't necessarily have to always suffer a concussion to um, have this link. Um, there's a link to an increased risk of neurodegenerative disease. So multiple hits to the head can then result in an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease, and a disease that has been truly linked to repeat hits to the head called CTE. And CTE refers to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, it is a disease that used to be called punch drunk syndrome, typically seen in boxers. However, in the recent 10 to 15 years, it, the, the connection between multiple hits to the head and chronic tra traumatic encephalopathy has been demonstrated to be uh, um, um, linked significantly. And what you see here are pictures of a human brain. Basically, if you took your brain and, and sliced it this way, and this is what a normal brain would look like. Um, and what you see here in these other two images are these brown patches. These brown patches are um, deposits of something called phosphorylated tau. And what this phosphorylated tau is, it's a very sticky substance. It makes it difficult for neurons to work properly. And you can see that it progresses. At first, there may be some small pockets of this phosphorylated tau, but as the disease progresses, you see a much larger accumulation of this, of this um, substance. And the accumulation is seen in areas of the brain that tend to correlate with some of the symptomatology of that particular disease. And this was um, a work that has been expanded quite significantly by Dr. Ann McKee and her colleagues. So that has been an overview of just brain injury, um, both in the context of traumatic brain injury and in the context of um, strangulation-induced brain injury. And we're gonna transition now to talk about how, just like professional athletes and soldiers, we now know that women and children who are impacted by intimate partner violence are going to be more likely than even the general public to suffer from a brain injury. And with that, I'm going to now um, transfer this to my colleague, Sonia. Thank you.
As a researcher, I tend to love stats to really get a feel for how prevalent issues are. So the upcoming stats are ones that never cease to floor me when I think about the magnitude of this issue in survivors of IPV. We know that approximately one in four women experience IPV in their lifetime, which gives us the number of 30 million women in the US alone. We also know that up to 92% of survivors receive facial or head injuries during violent episodes. And those numbers are probably underreported. We tend to use the um, term women here because most of the research that has been done on IPV um, survivors with brain injury is also connected um, to the research done on women. So we have a lot more that needs to be done. But I do want to put in there that um, approximately 54% of transgender and gender expansive people have experienced some form of IPV in their lifetime, very large percentage. Um, so based on those earlier numbers, um, approximately 27 million women likely show signs or symptoms of brain injury. My colleague often talks about this as a diagnosis of exclusion, that if you know a survivor who has had some type of hit to the head, has been strangled, there is a good likelihood that they have suffered a brain injury. Which once again underscores this idea that the prevalence of uh, brain injury in the context of domestic violence is estimated at 11 to 12 times greater than the published incidents of brain injury from occupational, recreational, or accident events. It's happening to many, many survivors that you know. And the majority of survivors who show symptoms of brain injury never seek medical care. And I think, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but we, we know many reasons why they don't seek medical care. So when we look at strangulation, um, the numbers are also alarming. Um, many of you probably already know that strangulation in the context of domestic violence is a very lethal warning sign. If someone's partner has choked them so that they pass out, they lose consciousness, we often say that that is a sign that they're more likely to try to kill their partner in the future. We also know that 68% of women in abusive relationships report that strangulation is a component of the abuse. And this is higher in some cultures than others. It's also really prevalent right now um, with young people as a component of sexual relations as well, which is very concerning. Um, so I do believe we really need to get that information out about how harmful strangulation can be. And oftentimes there are no external signs of injury, which is something um, that I didn't know right, um, right away when we started looking at that. Um, but it makes sense. Lots of um, people bruise differently. Um, different skin tones can also mask um, some of those signs. So someone could be choked to lose to the loss of consciousness without showing signs of that. Uh, strangulation results in what is called hypoxic ischemic brain injury, and the symptoms are much like those of the traumatic brain injury that Dr. Kozlowski talked about earlier. And majority, again, of survivors who show these symptoms never seek medical care. We are gonna show you a clip here um, of a survivor talking about the impact um, of her strangulation and how that impact impacted her life. You hear people talk about evil in someone's eyes, like he looked through me like I wasn't even there. And I remember him putting his hands around my throat and, and like thinking like, I'm going to die. When we think about the first picture of a domestic violence victim, the kind of classic iconic image of a battered woman as a woman with a black eye, right? Which one of the things that I realized now in the context of this work is she very well could have had a concussion. 
in the context of that black eye, but it is something that none of us in the field have thought about. And I don't remember much after that, but a nosy neighbor saved my life. Like somebody had heard all the stuff going on and um, knocked on the door. And that was the only reason I'm still alive. Um, and how we had it, it's one of those things you, you say it, you look at the data, we talk about brain injury and hits to the head, and it becomes very obvious very quickly. But even in my role at my organization as a um, statewide leader, having led a trauma-informed initiative across the state, trained in other states around the work that I was doing, never once had I mentioned brain injury. And how did we manage to miss that? 81% had reported um, being hit in the head. Um, uh, mo uh, 50% or so, so many times that they couldn't remember. And 83% of the survivors working with the organizations reported that they um, had been uh, choked or strangled um, so that their um, brains had been deprived of oxygen. And, and the sad part for me is I'm an EMS educator. Like I treat, I teach trauma. That's like one of the things I love and yet even though as much as I know about trauma, I totally missed the strangulation part, the brain, and, and the effects that it's had on my body. Many survivors who have been living with unmet need regarding brain injury intervention for a long time do end up developing comorbid issues like mental health um, issues and substance use issues, struggles with suicide. Um, so unless we're identifying the underlying brain injury early, there can be other um, long-term health impacts for survivors of domestic violence who are not receiving the services that they need. At one point, I attempted suicide. Um, and so it was like, if they would have found this earlier, like, you know, my family has watched, and my friends and family have watched me, you know, try to end my own life and stuff. And it's like, that all could have been avoided had the right people had the right knowledge. This has just kind of changed how we think about things and how we uh, want to do things and we're very, very hungry for helping us tackle this because this really hasn't been tackled in this way before and helping us from a practice level figure out what this needs to look like in the very complicated, very challenging work that domestic violence agencies do. The video was from our partners in Ohio um, who are doing wonderful work in this area, and we will be referencing um, some of their work and materials later on. So one thing the survivor and the others in the video talked about is that there are a lot of um, difficult side effects that come about as a result of brain injury. Oftentimes, survivors will end up with poor physical and mental health outcomes, um, increased use of substances as a way of trying to cope with those on their own, may see different abnormal relationship functioning, increased aggression and perpetration of abuse, and also, as Dr. Kozlowski said, long-term neurological consequences. I'll turn it back to Dorothy. So I had mentioned that repeat hits to the head um, can result in an increased propensity and increased risk for things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera. Um, and that there is a very strong link between in, in the military, in sports, between repeat hits to the head and CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This has not been studied well enough yet in survivors of intimate partner violence to indicate that they too are experiencing the same things. However, data is starting to become um, more available. For example, this is um, these are some images from a paper in 2021 who um, had a case study of a 29-year-old female who uh, was abused and unfortunately she died due to her abuse and her brain was provided for autopsy. And basically you see here um, 
staining for phosphorylated tau indicative that there might be um, some CTE type of neuropathology. Um, another more uh, another study in 2023 looked at 84 cases of individuals, and in this particular study, they did not find CTE, but they did definitely find evidence of brain injury. They found increases in uh, the incidence of epilepsy, evidence of strokes, and of course, then also Alzheimer's disease. So we still need to learn more. There's still not enough information out there yet about whether um, repeat hit uh, head injuries um, in survivors of intimate partner violence will always result in CTE, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to get some more clarity on that soon. Oops. So we mentioned that um, Dr. Kozlowski and I are part of a coalition in Illinois working to address this issue. And some of our main goals are to educate survivors and the professionals who work with them um, on this intersection of brain injury and DV, basically translating, transforming, and treating using what we know about brain injury in athletes and in the military to develop and validate effective approaches um, for survivors of IPV. And of course, because we are researchers, also to add to the body of literature on this topic. Back in um, 2019, um, Dr. Kozlowski, myself, and another colleague um, were able to be guest editors and help put together um, what current researchers were doing at the time related to this topic. We had started out with the idea that it would be, you know, one special issue and it turned into a two volume um, special issue, um, really looking at um, the various folks around the country who were addressing this topic. Um, and if any of you um, after decide you want to check out some of those PDFs and you do not have access to them, full access, just let Dorothy or I know and we definitely could send them to you. We also have a colleague of ours um, who's at Harvard, who also was able to put together a special issue um, in the Journal of Head Trauma Rehabilitation on this topic. So definitely more and more people addressing the topic. Okay, so what are some of these implications? Um, most survivors are not aware that their symptoms are due to a brain injury. And this is not shocking. If you're anything um, like Dorothy and I were when we first heard of this intersection um, back in the, the late teens, um, not our teens, but um, 2016, 2017, we, it hadn't been on either of our radar. And I had worked in the field for quite a while. Dr. Kozlowski was working in the uh, field of concussions for quite a while. So it's not surprising that many survivors do not equate their symptoms to brain injury. They may be equating them to PTSD, to the trauma, which is also true, of course. Um, but we now know that these symptoms can affect so much, right? They can affect their initial interviews that they have with the police, with the paramedics. They can affect their ability to access services, following instructions, filling out forms, falling following through with appointments, and those abilities to make decisions regarding their family and the abusive partner, regarding safety, next steps. When one has had a concussion, when one's brain is foggy and one's executive functioning is not where it should be, it's gonna be really challenging to make those next steps. So, um, some of the emotional symptoms that a survivor might be struggling with um, are that they can become easily frustrated, as we had mentioned, perhaps even aggressive or inappropriate behavior. They're gonna feel anger and rage, have mood fluctuations, be more impulsive than normal, and can exacerbate their mental health challenges, increased anxiety, PTSD, depression. And so then, 
what we might see when working with them is that they might appear non-compliant with services. They might say things without thinking about them, have trouble getting along with others. Um, they might not follow directions. They may feel very hopeless. They might withdraw or be isolated. And we can see this a lot when we're working with folks in shelter services. And they might be talking about harming themselves or others. Different cognitive symptoms. Survivors may struggle with memory problems, taking longer to think of or find words. Um, might be difficult to comprehend what we're trying to tell them. Um, may be difficult to just get started on a task and follow through, which once again, we can easily see this in, in the services we provide. It might be challenging for them to really stay on task and maintain attention when they're listening to us, be harder to problem solve. They might have challenges with real um, risk assessment or judgment and that executive functioning, as I mentioned. So then what this can look like when we're working with survivors is that we'll see them getting easily distracted difficulty concentrating when we're trying to talk through safety planning or job hunting or next steps in their care. They might be confused, um, forget lots of things that we're trying to tell them and there are right lots of things we're trying to get across. They may not seem very focused or we might say it's scatterbrained. They don't start something or follow through they seem not engaged or interested in services that we have. Some people might even describe them as unmotivated or lazy. They're missing deadlines, missing appointments we've set up, may not complete forms or tasks, and they're always seem to be losing their train of thought. And then finally, physical symptoms. Survivors can be really struggling with sensitivity to light and sound. Even vision problems, you know, blurry vision, poor sleep, might even have seizures, headaches, or migraines. And even if they had some of these before, it could be that they've gotten worse. They might be dizzy or have poor balance, be fatigued. If they've been strangled, they might have difficulty swallowing or neck pain. And then what we're going to see is folks may be saying, you know, I'm in a fog or describing so many physical ailments and always seem to be complaining about physical things that are wrong with them. Um, might not be sleeping, having difficulty falling asleep or sleeping way more than would be typical. Problems with their hearing or their eyesight. They might seem fatigued and no energy all the time, very easily overwhelmed, bothered by noise, by light. They might even trip or bump into furniture, and they just might say they're too tired to engage in any normal activities. So what we know, and I'm asked this a lot, is how do we know what's PTSD? How do we know what's brain injury? And that bothered me more at the beginning too. And what I've learned, especially from a lot of our neuroscience colleagues, so we, we don't have to know. We don't have to know which of their symptoms are from one or the other because in reality, they overlap. And you see in the middle there, so many symptoms are very similar and the same at times. You know, that fatigue and sleep problems, memory, depress depression, anxiety, irritability, or cognitive problems, um, and sometimes more, right? So it's okay to know that it can be a brain injury, especially if we know they have been strangled or they have been um, had an injury to their head um, and they've had trauma. So um, what we know is best is to assume that maybe both of those are contributing to their different symptoms. One of the things that I think is an important takeaway is just thinking about our own perspective on this, given the fact that we know all these symptoms that survivors can be dealing with due to the trauma and due to potential brain injury. Is it that they won't follow through with what they're asking them or they won't engage in shelter services um, that they're supposed to, or is it that they actually can't right now, right? Sort of 
this added perspective for me on all the consequences of a brain injury has helped me to really think about and help underscore that many of the survivors we're working with probably can't follow through in the way that we're hoping they would. So we need to accommodate them. So basically, when people are struggling with our services, consider that a head injury might be one of the possible reasons why. Okay, so sometimes, you know, given everything that, that Sonia has just presented, um, some individuals who work with survivors ask us, well, are we supposed to be diagnosing them with a brain injury? And our response to that is always no. <laughs> um, they're not medical professional. I'm not a medical professional and neither is Sonia. Um, and and to, be, to be honest, brain injury itself is not an easy diagnosis, especially in domestic violence. There's not um, a, a blood test you can take um, that says, yes, you for sure have a brain injury. Um, there is imaging. Uh, if someone comes in after being hit in the head, usually some uh, scanning, a CT scan will be done to just verify primarily that there's not any bleeding in the brain. Um, but there's not really a, a perfect diagnostic test um, that you can give that says, yes, you indeed have a brain injury. A lot of times as I was hit in the head, I was strangled, and now I have these symptoms. Um, in the context of DV, however, our our colleagues in Ohio, there are some tools out there. One is called the HELPS tool. Um, the other is something called the CHATS tool that our colleagues in Ohio have been using. And this has helped them um, just get a little bit of clarity around some of the survivors that they're working with. And it can open the door to conversation with these survivors about you know, maybe you should see a medical professional because there may be some brain injury occurring. And this is just a, a demonstration. It's a very quick uh, survey. It basically asks first if anyone choked or strangled you, whether you've been hit or hurt in the head or face um, or neck. After you were hurt, did any of these things happen? And then, um, have you ever thought you should see a doctor? So, so like I said, this is not a diagnosis, but it can help someone working with a survivor get a feel for whether that might be something that they should um, recommend, i.e. to go see a medical professional. Um, the problem is, is that access to brain injury services are, are challenging. It requires multiple approaches, like I said before, very individualized. Um, usually it starts with an emergency room or a primary care physician, then potentially a referral to a neurologist or to other specialists. Um, and it has to be very individualized with medications, with certain therapies, et cetera. Although there are a lot of concussion clinics now available, a lot of them really focus on sports concussion per se and, and aren't necessarily ready to work with someone who has all the complexities of a survivor of intimate partner violence. And then lastly, as we mentioned, the brain injury itself can make it very challenging for an individual who needs this care to make the appointments, find care, follow up, et cetera. Okay. Um, there are also a lot of other barriers to treatment for survivors of intimate partner violence. Um, first, they have an overall general mistrust of health and legal providers based on their previous experience, past interactions, and sometimes even the influence of the perpetrator of the violence. Um, survivors can also uh, fear seeking help for consequences of losing guardianship of their children. If they're diagnosed as someone with a brain injury, that can be used against them in the legal system. Um, and, and it makes sense. Survivors are often going to choose resources that ensure their safety over their health care. They need to find shelter. They need a restraining order. They need other things that are more important for their safety before they can start addressing their own medical or health needs. Um, we know that there are healthcare disparities. There are, is inequity in terms of access to services. 
And there is definitely an imbalance in terms of survivors um, who are from underrepresented backgrounds. They are ones who experience intimate partner violence more than, um, um, than white individuals. So these healthcare disparities um, follow suit with that. And then lastly, providers really benefit. They themselves don't necessarily know about this connection between brain injury and intimate partner violence. It's not something that they've been taught or they've, ex uh, they've been uh, experiencing. So um, one of the things we're trying to do is to educate providers so that they can understand the needs of survivors with possible brain injury. And, you know, like I said, concussion clinics out there are for, for athletes a lot of the times. And, you know, athletes don't have a lot of these special needs that a survivor might have. And so there's a lot of data out there that demonstrates that in order for survivors to get appropriate care for intimate partner violence and brain injury, um, these things need to be considered. Uh, it needs to be considered that they have very unstable social situations. They're going to need things like transportation and childcare. Like I mentioned, they're going to put safety, uh, their own safety, their family safety above the need for their own health care. They're going to have difficulty managing their care due to brain injury and the influences of the abuser. So um, there are a number of institutions out there, a number of groups who are trying to put together this community of care, understanding that it needs to be multidisciplinary, team-based, and needs to have a guiding advocate. The survivor needs someone to connect with to help them navigate their care along with the other social services they need. Um, this is just an example of a few that we're aware of. There may be more out there, um, but these are ones that we are aware of that are trying to do just that, trying to create a community of care for survivors, specifically with brain injury. And that really is one of the reasons why we in Illinois have created this coalition. So I'm gonna let Sonia talk more about that. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Dorothy, if you want to maybe click on the link just to let people know if you want to um, check out our coalition website, we definitely have some different information and tools there um, that you could access as well. I know we are a ways away from all of you, but you can easily check out um, we have some research on there. We have some different resources and any of that you are more than welcome to take a look at and see if anything would be helpful um, for you as well. We definitely are addressing um, different issues. Like we said, education is one of our, our main pillars. Um, we do a lot of trainings like the one we are doing with you all today. We also do some advocacy work, mainly in the state of Illinois. Um, research, Dr. Kozlowski and I are engaged in numerous research projects um, to look at the prevalence of this issue because we know that lots of times um, getting an understanding of those numbers also is helpful in getting funding for different services. And then that leads us to the services. So we're in the midst of some different um, research and um, service projects now with different domestic violence agencies in the Chicagoland area that are really trying to put together this network um, of care that Dr. Kozlowski was speaking to. So that's just a little bit about us. We also know some of the other coalitions um, that are also addressing the issue. And some of these you might be aware of already. Um, we talk about our partners in Ohio a lot um, because they are doing great work. Um, Rachel Ramirez is someone who's talking and leading trainings around the country on this issue. And the state of Ohio overall is really working to put in place a lot of um, good services for survivors. So definitely check them out. Pink Concussions is another one. Um, Enema 
and um, in Canada, abused and brain injured. So you will have access to all of these links as well once the training is over. So again, just highlighting, um, you know, what you can do today. So consider head injury as one of the possible contributors when you are working with survivors. And then with that, there are more resources as well. So you have links right on this page, once again, to the educational materials that are offered on our website, and then the educational materials that are offered on the Ohio website. Um, Spoiler, spoiler alert, our materials are going to look like theirs because they are so kind and that they developed all these different materials, but then they allow them to be downloaded for free from their website. So definitely check them out. And what we did was we also um, got permission from them to put some of our statewide information and numbers, hotline numbers on some of the materials. And um, so we have those available on, on ours, but definitely feel free to check out any of those. And um, once again, you can download any of them that would be helpful as well. Um, just once again, a few um, more ideas of some of the types of materials that they have. One of these is really great, the Has Your Head Been Hurt card. And it really sort of walks through some of this in a very, um, you know, very regular language, not researcher language, not medical language, um, but walking through it in a way that many survivors connected with, you know, have you been hit in the face, neck, or head? Has anyone tried to choke or strangle you? You know, different physical symptoms. Um, and they have done those thus far in English and Spanish. So definitely great materials. And um, we always like to state that they didn't just come up with these materials um, thinking they were a good thing, but they actually did some research studies on them to show that they were actually found to be helpful, um, both for providers who are providing services to survivors with brain injury and then actually with the survivors themselves. And then um, this one has so many great links and resources right directed to the state of Alaska. So a lot of great links that you can check out to get even more local information. And finally, we just wanna thank you again for clicking on this link and wanting to watch this webinar, staying with us to the very end. And we do have our information there as well. If it would be helpful for any of you to reach out to us, our email addresses are on this slide and please do not hesitate to reach out. The way we attack this issue and provide better services for survivors is through talking and connecting with one another. So thank you very much.